Millions of Christians around the world are celebrating the birth of the Christ child. Now his birth was foretold in scripture that Mary was conceived, the babe by God, and on this night he was born. Of course there was a journey of about 90 miles that took place four or five days uh, before the birth. And of course, you know, I've never been pregnant, but I can only imagine <laughs> that it was an uncomfortable ride <laughs> for 90 miles by donkey. <laughs> can only imagine. There she is. So tonight, thousands of people, maybe hundreds of thousands of people around the world are participating in live nativity scenes. And um, I don't know if you've ever participated in one, but as a child, as a youth, as a teenager in Dayton, Ohio, I was privileged to be a part of a live nativity. We had joined a large evangelical church and they did this every year and I was so excited because there weren't many live nativities that I knew of in Dayton, Ohio. And here it was, I got to participate. But I was chosen or assigned to be a shepherd, a lowly shepherd. I hated being a shepherd. <laughs> you see, the shepherd had baggy clothes and they were made of burlap. So they were itchy and scratchy. I mean, I had my regular clothes underneath, but they were a little bit tattered. They were a little bit dirty. They were... Well, they were. They weren't what I wanted to wear, let me put it that way. So the older, the older uh, teens in my church, they played the bigger roles. You know, the king, Mary, Joseph. And then all the women, all the girls played angels. We had lots and lots of angels in our live nativity. But I had to wait, possibly, to have a, a role like that. And I really envied the role of, of being a king especially because they had fabulous outfits. <laughs> they were like really wonderful and I really wanted to wear one of those outfits but I wasn't old enough. And not only that, the older guys, I think it was uh, Rick Dawson and Kenny Hamilton and Ted Simmons, they had good hair, they had really nice hair. They had no acne, no pimples at all. And, and they all drove cars, you know, they were really cool. And they were going someplace, they were destined for greatness. I was a shepherd. <laughs> My life was about counting sheep and not stepping in sheep poo. <laughs> so it really wasn't a really wonderful role to be in. But then, lo and behold, we, you know, we were doing this pageant year after year, and I'm playing shepherd year after year. I'm really tired of it, but I did it, you know, because it's what, it's what they gave me. And then we were going to have the performance of performances. The Dayton Corral was coming to perform at our church. The Dayton Corral, mind you. And they were going to sing with my church choir. And not only that, my high school choir was invited as well. I was so excited that I was going to be a part of this musical extravaganza, but I was going to play a shepherd. And I was a little bit embarrassed that my classmates were going to see me as a shepherd. But I showed up. I put my shepherd's garb on, and then the call came that Kenny Hamilton, wise man number three, had the flu. Now, mind you, I'm shepherd number three, so I'm really down on the, on the totem pole. But shepherd number one and shepherd number two happened to sing in the choir. They were tenors. So there was no one else, and there was no other older team who was willing to take on the garb, you know, to wear the turban with the jewels on, a turban. I, I mean, I just couldn't believe how beautiful those costumes were. And so it finally came down to there was no one else left and they turned to me and said, would you be a, a wise man? 
I said, would I be a wise man? Are you kidding? I, I mean, I just couldn't believe what, had, what luck had come my way. And so I ripped off those baggy burlap clothes and I ceremoniously put on this beautiful outfit of tapestry and uh, satin and velvet and that beautiful turban. I couldn't believe it. I know that it probably was as tacky as I'll get out, but it was fabulous and I couldn't believe it. And I walked out in the hallway and there was my high school choir in the hallway and they saw me walk out as a king. Hi, I was a king. I wasn't a lowly shepherd. Now I have to tell you the lowly shepherd role was one that I really had embodied because I didn't have much self-esteem. I felt like I deserved to be a lowly shepherd. I never felt like I deserved to be a king, but here I was, I was a king. And I walked out the hallway and then walked in to the sanctuary and processed down the aisle. And this song was going on, star of wonder, star of night. Oh, I was feeling it. I was feeling it. I don't even know if I was carrying the mirth, the frankincense, or the gold. I was feeling it. I was a king. And I got down at the end where the babe was, and, and there's two choirs up here and a choir over here, and I'm in the epicenter of this incredible experience in the music. And then they went to Handel's Hallelujah Chorus. I tell you, the vibrational force of that song in that moment, my heart was going like this. I was coming out of my skin. I was, I, it was a transcendent moment. And I was a king. I was a king in that moment. It was beautiful. It was beautiful. So, many years later, I started to understand the significance of that moment, of that experience of being a king, because I had lived my life as a shepherd. Now, there is nothing wrong with shepherds. Shepherds are really honorable, good, and, and um, metaphysically, they, they play a very vital role. They, they bring people together. They lead the flock. I'm a shepherd right now. You know, I mean, I'm still a shepherd but I can wear fabulous clothes when I want to. <laughs> but the, tra the transformation that took place, or started to take place in that moment in time, was one that started to build because I started to see the light. I started to see the light of the star, the same star that the, shepherd, that the shepherds followed and that the wise men followed. I started to experience that. And there's no, it's really synchronistic, I think, that there was a star that led them to the Christ child. Because, you know, each and every one of us really are made up. Our bodies, our physical bodies, the atoms in our bodies are made up of stardust. Carl Sagan said that 40% of us is actually the atoms of stars. That's no accident. And what that tells me is, is that not only do we have light in us, that we are seeking light, just like the wise man. We are seeking light. The light is also seeking us. There's a relationship going on there. And sometimes it's really easy to forget that we're light, that we have the light of God in us. It's really easy to forget that. And we, our responsibility is to be reminded of that, to live in that. So the wise men represent the wisdom that's carried from the soul from previous incarnations. You see, we have an inner wisdom that is carried down through our DNA. And the East represents within man's inner consciousness. So the wise men instinctively knew 
to follow that star. That at where that star was, was the gift, the gift of the Christ consciousness. And the star represents our first awakening before we realize our Christ wisdom and power. And the star of Bethlehem rep symbolizes our inner conviction of our own divinity. I experienced that in that moment, the plain alignment. I experienced probably for the first time my inner divinity. Because not only was I chosen to be a wise man by default, but I was chosen to be a wise man. I took on the role. I took on the mantle in that moment. My head was high. It was a glorious, glorious experience. So the Christmas message for me to you is to follow your star, that it will, it is there, and that each and every one of us is seeking our star. Sometimes people appear like they really know where their star is, and maybe they do, but most of us are seekers. We are continuously seeking that star in our lives, and that star is guiding us to our Christ self. Merry Christmas. I'd like to take this time to go into a time of guided prayer and meditation. So I'm going to invite you to close your eyes or to focus on something in the room. To be aware of your breath. To be aware of that light within you. To see that light, to experience that light, to feel it throughout our bodies, in our hearts, in our minds, to experience the light. For this is the light that leads us to our wholeness. This is the light that centers us in love. This is the light that brings on abiding peace that we surrender into. This is the light of our faith that guides us. And that this time, in this moment, that you experience the fullness of the light that is within you, around you, inside, outside. We are the light. And as we go into a couple moments of silence, I want you to, to think on this phrase, I am the light of the world. I am the light of the world. I am the light of the world in the silence. And as we bring our awareness back to the room, and as we bring our awareness back into our bodies, as we open our eyes and see the light that's all around us, we give thanks for this moment that we've been given to celebrate the light inside of us around us and others. Thank you, God, for this light. Follow your star.